Rivalino, Brazilian legend, is my dad's favorite all-time player. So the idea that you're ahead of him in any context this, this must nauseate so my father. This makes me so, <laughs> so happy. Hello, Sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue-colored glasses. This show, will be talking Das U.S. Women's National Team Reboot, UCL slash CCC, uh, Pulisic, Cucho, Holden Tears, Eclipse, The Boss, Anatomy of a Fall, Anatomy of a Dive, the EPL title race, MLS's best signing, and so much more. But first, join me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how are you doing on this Monday, April 8th in the year 2024? I'm doing well. I'm dying to know how the college visits went. Is there a leader in the clubhouse for your daughter? There there are multiple ones. I'll, I'll, I'll hold off on that for a little bit here. But we did. We had a good time out on the East Coast. Uh, my, my daughter and I... Uh, traipsed all over the place, saw a bunch of different places. And again, these are all first world problems uh, for her. But at some point here in the next few weeks, she's going to have to come to a decision. I think we've narrowed it down. She's actually with my wife right now uh, in the Midwest looking at some too. So she's got a, a, um, a lot of options out there. So she's a very fortunate young lady and uh, whatever she picks is going to be fine. But it was fun. It was great to spend time with her. It was great to uh, go around that e uh, the East Coast and uh, have a good time. What'd you, what'd you get up to, my friend? Couple of things. Uh, last Thursday was the Springsteen concert at the Forum, which was phenomenal. That's right. Seventy-four years old, he did over three hours, more than thirty songs, everything from Rosalita to Thunder Road, Born to Run, Back what, he what, what was the opening? Uh, he opened with a cover, and then he went to Lonesome Day. Got it. Got um, it. The Rising, Dancing in the Dark. Special uh, guests? Any special guests? His wife came out and performed Patty, a couple oh, of songs. Patty Scalfa. Yeah. By the way. I bought her album the day it came out. Um, I'm not a big Bruce fan. I know that's sacrilege, but I'm not a big Bruce fan. I love her album. Um, it's it's just so good. And obviously, it's very Bruce-influenced, but I, I think her voice is incredible and unique, and obviously, she's been a part of his band for a long time. Erin Schechter was there, too. She was buzzing afterwards. Really? Yeah. She uh, Did she like the sound? Because I know that's uh, something that's important for her. Actually, this morning she spoke to me about some potential sound issues. So really? maybe she didn't love the concert as much as she made it seem right afterwards. Well, I mean, she loved the con she's telling us right now that she loved the concert. But, you know, she's also in that world and the audio world. And so I'm sure she's going to have a literally a keen ear to what's going on. And, you know, sound it has nothing to do necessarily with the artist. Oftentimes it's it's the, the uh, place that you're playing. Obviously, that uh, you know, this is Bruce, so he's got to have state-of-the-art stuff, but there's still, there's only so much that you can do. But you had a good time. I had a great time. Okay, so that was one. Uh, number two, last night was the final episode ever of Curb Your Enthusiasm, wrapping up the 12th and final season. And? Did uh, it go I liked, out the way uh, Seinfeld went out? Well, he very cleverly played off the Seinfeld finale, which is the one blemish in his career, and he did it in a way that made this quite funny. So okay. I, I liked it. I think he, quote unquote, stuck the landing. Do you really think it's done? You never know with him. He right? could decide it, in a couple of years. This is a years. return already, right? I mean, yeah. he took some uh, time off. So. And, and, and plot-wise, it ended in a way where they could absolutely <laughs> do more seasons. <laughs> All right. Well, what, it's a hell of a run. A uh, hell of a run. I know it's one of your uh, favorites out there. Um, okay, see, well, let's see what I've watched. So I've been on planes, right? And on planes, oftentimes I'll get a different library than what I have at home, you know, with my streaming services and everything like, there, uh, like that. So I was on, I don't know, uh, I was on Delta. Um, and I, I don't even, sometimes I don't register when you talk, especially when you talk about the Academy Awards and everything. And there's just so many and I can't keep track of them all. But the uh, Anatomy of a Fall, I ended up watching. <sighs> All right. Well, it, I should I just say I ended up watching Anatomy of a Fall and The Zone of Interest, not knowing that these were things that you definitely talked about. I mean, it just it goes in here one out the uh, out the other. But these were up for pictures of the year. And the same actress, the German actress, Sandra Huller, who I am infatuated with because we don't know anything about her. Who was the uh, the German guy that came out a few years ago in Inglorious Bastards or whatever? Oh God! And then he was in everything all over the place. Um, anyway, you, you know, you guys know what I'm talking about. I'm sure people are just yelling at their uh, at their steering wheel right now. 
Christoph Waltz. There we go. Thank you. Uh, it's the same type of thing where she's getting her due as an incredible actress. Now, of the two, I think I liked Anatomy of a Fall better than the Zone of Interest. I get what the Zone of Interest is trying to do, and you know, it's it, it, it's this bucolic thing set in this horrible, you know, uh, situation, literally in their backyard of of the concentration camp. But I I I did not have a Zone of Interest in it, in that I lost interest very very quickly. But the acting in it, and I think both of these are kind of geared towards acting. And sometimes when that's all there is, and I'm not saying the stories aren't interesting, I'm not saying it isn't artistic, but that's all there is, uh, it, it, it's, especially with my small little brain, it leaves something to be desired. But I get why, I understand completely why they, they were nominated because of the artistry and the romance, and it's the anti-Hollywood type of movie, so. Did you like both of those, by the way? I liked both of them, you yes. You did like both of those. Um, are you going to watch The Eclipse today? By the way, we're recording this on Monday. The Eclipse is happening. Do you, do, do you going to do anything? Do you care? I do not. The country's going nuts right now. I know. Uh, it doesn't interest me. Yeah, it doesn't. And it's, you know, four minutes of, uh, of excitement out there. All right. Should we light this candle, my friend? Let's do it. Where should we start? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, basketball. Did you watch the basketball? I was going to get to that later. You are? Okay, okay, let's keep that. Okay, so let's light the candle then, right? Yes. Okay, where should we start? Well, first off, I do want to note, we're going to devote the entire Ask Alexi segment today to the U.S. women. We yes. got an excellent question, so we're going to use it as a jumping off point down there to talk Japan, Canada, et cetera. Uh, but we're going to be begin this segment on the men's side. It was another eventful weekend in Europe. First up, Italy, AC Milan with a 3-0 home win over Lecce. Christian Pulisic got the party started with a left-footed strike. LAFC bound Olivier Giroud and Rafael Leon got the other goals. For Pulisic, it was his 10th league goal of the campaign, which is a career high. His previous best had been the nine he scored in his first season for Chelsea. He becomes the second American to score double-digit goals in a season in a top four European league, the other being Clint Dempsey, who did it twice at Fulham. And I also saw people celebrating this weekend that he is now the most successful American ever to play in Serie A. You had a funny retort to that on X. You channeled your Roger Murdoch. Oh, yeah, I did the dragging uh, Lanier and uh, who was the other one? Walton up and down the court type yes. of thing. Yeah, it, it, look, uh, I mean, it's not even a question, I think, right now. As good as, you know, Michael Bradley was and obviously what Weston McKinney is doing right now. You know, and there are others that have had cups of tea and I was only here for a couple, uh, couple of seasons. But, I mean, what Christian Pulisic is doing right now should make any American soccer fan proud. I'm happy that this has worked out for him. I'm happy that he has found a place where on the field he is valued uh, so much so that he can even tape games off and they value him so much that he's right back in the starting 11, but also that he's staying healthy. And by all accounts, he seems to be enjoying his time in Italy. It would not surprise me in the least if he extends it uh, you know, through, uh, through the next years because he has become that valuable. And it, and it also... You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, his time, in, in his, his goal scoring compare and contrast. I think he's also, sometimes we forget how young he was when he burst on the scene, as we do for a lot of these American players. And they physically have changed. Obviously, the mental part of the game and the growth of the game and the experiences that they have will change them as players. And I think that seeing this more mature Christian Pulisic in the way that he plays the game and even in the the way his body has filled out, um, sometimes sometimes you look at it and say, well, this is as good as it's going to get. Well, I still think that he can get better. And given some of the challenges that he's had in the past years, I'm so glad that he's landed at a place where it's going well for him. Now, this has been happening all season, but it really percolated this weekend on X. You have Americans throwing Pulisic success in the face of Chelsea fans. Well, Chelsea fans are downplaying it because they view Serie A as a wholly inferior league to the Premier League. They think that all that's happened here is he, quote unquote, found his level, which is a condescending expression they like to use. What do you make of it? This is, this is so stupid. <laughs> and, you know, because, you know, we talk about, you know, coaches, for example. Who's the, the famous basketball coach that's just going now? That's, everyone's all going crazy. John Calipari. John Calipari, right? Well, we, I mean, we talk about coaches and they have ups and downs. They have good seasons and bad seasons. And just because you have a bad season doesn't mean you're not a quality coach. And the change in circumstances, yes, that is going to impact your, for, for, uh, your fortune. Now, 
your CV and your history, of course, people are going to look at it and you're going to try to hedge your bets with what has happened, what has happened before. But especially when we're talking about these different types of league, it is a different country and culture. It's not just the 90 minutes. It's what you and oftentimes your significant other could be wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it ends up being, a family, kids adjusting to that country and culture. You could be adjusting to a new language. There are so many different factors that go into whether when that whistle blows, you are able to be uh, able to be successful. And so I don't think that this is, that this should be looked at from an EPL perspective or a Chelsea perspective in that they didn't get the best out of him. It was just, it was the time. It wasn't right. Who knows? Maybe it was you know, positionally where he, where he was, but that this player has emerged now doesn't mean that at that time it was just lurking behind and they didn't have the ability to bring it out. Maybe this is the path that he needed to take to get the best version of Christian Pulisic. Uh, Musa, incidentally, did not start, came on for Pulisic in the second half. Uh, Juventus, meanwhile, claimed a much-needed 1-0 home win over Fiorentina. Gatti with the only goal. McKinney started. Timmy Weah, an unused sub. Unused sub from Timmy Weah. Yeah, I mean, so in the hierarchy right now of American national team players that are playing in Italy, and by the way, I would have loved to have had some friends in Italy at the time. I mean, on my team, nobody spoke any English, and they're at that at that point, a long time ago, back in the 1900s, you only allowed three uh, foreign players at a, at a time on the field, and so you were like on an island out there. But if you had a hierarchy. I'm, I think Christian Pulisic right now is what we just talked about. Then Weston McKinney. Then, hmm, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? Wea and then Musa, right? I think that would be it. I could go either way on that. Yeah. They've both been uh, subs for their teams, although Musa played this weekend, Wea did not. So yeah. maybe Wea is farther down the pecking order at Juventus than Musa. Is I, but, I, but I definitely think both Musa and Wea obviously are looking at their situation right now and saying, all right, do I see a change? And they're probably and in the respective teams are also looking at him saying, hey, is this something Is this something that's going to change going forward? And I don't know if it is. I think right now there is a massive separation between the Weston McKinney's uh, and Christian Pulisic's and the uh, Musa and Weyas. But look, the fact that they have guys around to hang out with or call or train with and do all that kind of stuff, that's a, that's a wonderful advantage. Next up, we go to the Premier League where we have a tremendous title race. Arsenal and Manchester City both handled their business this weekend. Arsenal 3-0 away to Brighton, Saka, Havertz, and Trossard with the goals. While City, it was 4-2 away to Crystal Palace. Kevin De Bruyne scoring twice. Then in the match of the weekend, Liverpool was held to a 2-2 draw away to Manchester United. Luis Diaz in the first half. Then Bruno Fernandes and Mino overturned matters. A Sala penalty late, tied it up again. So the weekend ends with Arsenal and Liverpool at 71. Arsenal ahead on goal difference. City one point behind at 70. And so this has obviously come down to the top three and when that music stops, where they are going to be. Uh, a couple months ago, I think, maybe not even, uh, we were talking about Arsenal. And I think both of us at the time said, all right, that's, it's just not going to be there. Now they find themselves certainly in it. And certainly for a lot of people looking at it as even a favorite. And everybody's just waiting for one of these three to drop points, which is ultimately what happened uh, with, Liver with Liverpool. The, you know, Man City, obviously, Erlen Holland getting back after what we talked about and Kevin De Bruyne <laughs> just being, being awesome. Uh, they should beat Palace. And Arsenal, as, as good as Brighton can be, should and did the job there. And so when you're looking down at these top three, it's interesting when you get to the Liverpool-Manchester United game because I think you can make an argument that Liverpool should be this version in this moment of Manchester United, and yet they weren't able to do that. So what say you, Mossy? How does this change the calculation right now? Is it, is it even more wide open in terms of, Picking the three? It is even more wide open. Liverpool were incredibly wasteful in the first half of that match. They should have been up way more than 1-0. And then Kwanzaa makes the mistake early in the second half. Bruno Fernandes, by the way, made that look easier than it was. Yep. The way he one-timed that uh, over Keller and into the goal. Um, a couple of thoughts on that match. Uh, Mino is the real deal. I hope Gareth yep. Southgate has the courage to start him at the Euros because he could be that third midfielder alongside Bellingham and Rice. 
Also, there was a disputed penalty late, Juan Bissak on Harvey Elliott. We're going to talk about this again when we discuss El Trafico. But as you always point out, there does not have to be contact for it to be a foul. But you get into this, uh, did the player go down because he had no choice as he was evading a challenge or was it a dive? I did not have a huge issue with this call. How did you feel about it? I didn't have an issue. Uh, and while there was controversy in a number of calls this week, I didn't have a huge issue uh, with this. Again, if I take a swing at you, Mossy, and you fall back and avoid my swing, I've still taken a swing at you, all right? It's one thing if you hit the ball. And by the way, just getting the ball, even that in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean that you haven't foul fouled somebody. So it is kind of wide open for the... I, I didn't think of the egregious ones out there in the <laughs> in history, I didn't think that this even rose to the rose to that level. So I don't know what all the all the screaming and uh, screaming and yelling was about. But in the in the race for the top and the title, it was obviously significant uh, because it gave uh, uh, Salah the ability to step up and at least salvage one point. But this has to be looked at as a loss from Jurgen Klopp and company. And obviously, the dropping of two points puts everything in play right now. Uh, before we depart, the Premier League, Tyler Adams did not play for Bournemouth against yeah. Luton due to back spasms, while Gio Reyna only played 10 minutes for Forrest against Tottenham, so a step back in that situation. Yeah, I mean, the, the good news, I guess, is that it's back spasms. The the bad news, I guess, it is that Tyler Adams is hurt again. Now, I, I guess you could look at it as we'd really be concerned if it had something to do with his serious injury in terms of his hamstring, but as we know, bodies compensate, and so is it a situation... And I, 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 I feel like in the back of my mind, I remember back problems or back spasms being something that he might have had. So maybe it's just a, a chronic thing. And hopefully he can get it sorted out. And hopefully it has nothing to do with the rest of his, uh, you know, equipment when it comes to the hamstring and stuff like that. So I, I hope that this is a temporary uh, short term type of thing. I mentioned Gio Reyna and Nottingham Forest. They lost away to Tottenham, but they got some good news today because Everton were docked two points, dragging them back into the relegation scrum. What are we the, at right now? Premier I don't have my calculator. Is handling this so poorly. Remember, they were docked 10 points initially, got it down to six on appeal. Now this is two points for a different charge, but they can appeal this. This should not be happening in drips and drabs like this. You got to just figure out what the entire punishment is and do it all at once. Yeah, I mean... So, and so where does that put them now? So it's, it still has them in a potential, not a potential, a relegation fight. Correct. Right? Wow. I mean, yeah, I, I think you, you hit it on the head. It, it like, why are we doing this right now? And there will be those that say, well, because you have to give people the benefit of the doubt and you have to go through the process. And this was an outside source that they used to adjudicate this. And to your point, they get to, you know, they're, they're going to, uh, fight this and try to have it less, but we're constantly having to do the calculation of where they are. It must be incredibly frustrating for the players and the coach to be in a situation like this where you don't actually know where you are and therefore you don't actually know what you are or not fighting for. So, because they'd be comfortably in the mid table right now if none of this had happened. Correct. They'll stop breaking the law then. Uh, staying in England, but dropping down a level to the championship. Uh, Coventry claimed the big 2-1 home win over Leeds United. Haji Wright with another goal in this one. Haji right, man. I mean, Haji, Haji is being right. And, and look, I, I, I don't know what has happened, what he is eating, what is going on. This is a good thing. I don't even have to know or understand. This is a player that I think both of us here and a lot of people had written off when it comes, because this is all relative to the national team. And, and again, I still don't think that this is the answer up top. And we saw a little bit of that in the, uh, in the window, but I'm happy for him, I'm happy that, again, it goes back to what we talked about, he's at a place where they know how to use him, he is obviously comfortable on and off the field, and he is feeling it, uh, feeling it right now. And I think it's very, gonna be very, very difficult for Greg Berhalter when he starts putting together this, uh, this list for Copa America for him to keep him off. Coventry, four points back of Josh Sargent and Norwich for the last promotion playoff spot. There's also a great battle for the two automatic promotion spots. Leeds, Ipswich, and Leicester separated by two points. Boy, promotion relegation is fun, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, I guess, it, well, promotion is fun. Uh, relegation is probably not so fun. Not liking pro rel is like not liking Bruce Springsteen. Exactly. Yeah, in that you get uh, screamed and yelled at and, and called horrible, horrible names. But you know what? I'm, I'm going to... 
I, although if you go on Spotify, uh, when I was in Italy, I recorded a couple of Bruce Springsteen covers for a tribute album to Bruce Springsteen. So uh, you can check that out. We go to the Netherlands next. Uh, PSV with a 5-1 home win over Azed Alkmaar. Serginho Des with an assist. Malik Tillman with two assists. Ricardo Pepe did not play due to a minor injury. You just talked about the battle for center forward spots with the U.S. national team. Pepe making news in the last few days. His agent had some interesting comments. He said this. First of all, there is complete understanding because Luke de Jong is a phenomenon and we must take our hats off to his achievements. But at the same time, this season is not good enough for Ricardo. 10% of all playing time is, of course, far too little. He understands, is patient, and congratulates Luke. But for himself, it is not enough. I have never met a player who was happy when he didn't play. If you play so little, you can lose your place in the national team. With the Copa America this year and the World Cup in two years' time in your own country, there are two great tournaments coming up. Ricardo wants and needs to be there. That's why it can't continue like this. He will have to take a step in his career. That's just normal. Every player wants to continue to grow and reach his full potential. Ricardo obviously prefers to do that at PSV. Ricardo is far from home and wants to have a home in Europe. Hmm. Well, this is from his agent? Yeah. Well, why the hell did his agent send him there? Did he think that he was going to be better than... Uh, who's he starting? Uh, or he's Luke, not starting? Luke de Young. Luke de Young? No. I mean... Did, did they just figure out that Luke Young is a good player? Or did you just think that Pepe was so good that he was going to walk in and, uh, and get the starting position? So I put it back on the agent. Maybe you poorly advised him in terms of where he, uh, where he has gone. So any, any repercussion and any challenges that he is now facing are of your own making. In the same way that I would put it on the agent of, uh, uh, of Gio Reyna putting him into that crap situation that he's in right now. Well, that's Georgie Mendes, the biggest agent in the game. All right. Well, Georgie, why is he there? Why did you put him over there? Why isn't he playing? Why? Your, your job as an agent is to find the best possible place for your client. And your job is, as an agent is to understand literally what is happening on the ground over there. All of the dynamics, all of the politics, all of the BS that exists in these places that you are putting your, 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 uh, your players in. Now, it doesn't mean that players aren't responsible. You can only, you know, you can lead them to water, right? But they have to drink. But if you know, your, if you know who your player is, then you put him or her in the best possible situation. Ugh, agents. You know, can't live with them, can't throw them off a bridge, but... I wonder how Ricardo Pepe superfan Doug McIntyre feels about all this. He probably agrees with the agent in that this is not sustainable. And, he does. and in, in that sense, I think what he's setting up is, hey, if this isn't going to change, this isn't, this isn't where he is going to be going forward. But I don't know why he's bringing up Copa America because they only have a few games left. They've won the league. And nothing's going to change in terms of his playing time that's going to change, I think, how Greg Berhalter feels good or bad about Ricardo Pepe if uh, he's just he's not going to play and then the summer is going to be here. So I don't know what that has to do with Copa America. The bed has been made. You got to lay in it and do the best. And I do think that Pepe has made the best of the situation. A fire nerd incidentally hammered Ajax 6-0 this past weekend. What a wretched season for Ajax. Um, yeah, they're in sixth right now. My yeah. goodness. That, I mean, that's almost... A bigger story than PSG, PSV running away with it. Uh, we go to Spain next. Uh, one American who had his heart broken this past weekend is our friend, our colleague, Stu Holden. Mallorca faced Athletic Bilbao in the Copa del Rey final. It finished 1-1, went to penalties, and Athletic Bilbao prevailed. Ah, I felt bad for Stu. He and his family, his lovely family, were over there uh, as, a, uh, as an owner of Mallorca. Obviously, a proud day. They got all dressed up. If you watch it, if you follow him on Instagram or anything, you, you saw the whole... Um, week progress, and they were so excited. And, you know, to be fair, that they were there was, I don't want to call it a miracle, but it was not something that he necessarily uh, expected. And it was not just an opportunity to win a cup, but also an opportunity to potentially get into Europe because uh, Europa was on the offing there. So disappointment all around and the added disappointment of losing in penalties, but a wonderful, wonderful accomplishment nonetheless for, uh, for Stu Holden. But uh, in the end, the penalties were too much, so they lose the Copa del Rey final. For Athletic Bilbao, their 24th Copa del Rey title, second to Barcelona. They've won it more often than Real Madrid. Now, are you not supposed to call it Bilbao now? What's the deal? It's, it's, it's just athletic. Athletic club. Le athletic club now, I think. It's what the, uh, the kids yeah, are that's, doing. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. But I'm old school. Yeah, you are old school. That's right. Okay. 
Uh, we go to Germany next. Uh, some interesting developments there. Bayern Munich have hit rock bottom domestically. They squandered <laughs> a two-goal lead, lost 3-2 to Heidenheim, while Leverkusen won one 0 away to Union Berlin. The gap is now 16 with six to play, which means Leverkusen can clinch the title this upcoming weekend. This up, that's that's Bayern esque at times, <laughs> right? So the it, amazing how it's flipped now. You got to feel that Bayern has said, listen, it has not been a good season, obviously domestically and from a cup perspective, but they still have this bird in the hand, which is Champions League, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so we transitioned to Are they putting that all? Next. Are they putting all their eggs in? The, is that? Uh, but but is that the mentality you think that's going on right now in the Bayern? Yes. All that's left for them to salvage this campaign is to win the Champions League. The quarterfinals get underway this week on Tuesday. Bayern will be away to Arsenal in the first leg. <laughs> And like we said, can you imagine if after all of this failure, and for Bayern Munich, this is a failure of a season so far, you could offset it. And so much so that not only could you, uh, could you disappear all of that failure, but you could overshadow <laughs> what Javi Alonso is doing over there with Labor, because my goodness. Yeah, Arsenal Bayern is interesting because Arsenal, I think, is clearly the better team in better form, but they don't have the pedigree in yep. this competition. Uh, there's still a part of me that looks at that Bayern squad on paper. It's still very good. On their day, they can be great. They're focused now on the Champions League, but Arsenal will have one eye on that Premier League title race. The second leg is in Munich, so I don't know. I could go either yeah, way. On yeah, this. but I, I do believe that this Arsenal team believes in themselves and believes they are as good, if not better, than anybody out there in the world. And so while they don't have that pedigree, I worry that Bayern Munich is just going to think, well, we're Bayern Munich. And, and as Real Madrid and others do in Barcelona, and it's relative to a past and relative to a history, and they're just going to think they're going to turn on the faucet and it's going to, uh, it's, you know, it's going to produce. And that's not all, always the case, although it would not surprise me in the least in, uh, in terms of how the soccer gods operate if Bayern Munich found a way past Arsenal. As a matter of fact, I'm even going to pick Bayern Munich ultimately finding a way in the two legs past Arsenal. Harry Kane has great numbers against Arsenal from Ooh, his days at right. Tottenham. Yes. Uh, also on Tuesday, Real Madrid will host Manchester City in a battle of the last two champions. It sounds like Kyle Walker is going to miss this match, which is bad news when you're going up against Vinicius Jr. How do you see it? I see 1-1 I see one -one maybe. Uh, I still think City go through because the second leg is at the Etihad. I yep. think that's a big advantage for them. Then Wednesday, PSG will host Barcelona in the first leg of that tie. 2 nothing PSG. And then they go through? Yeah, I think and then they go through, yeah. And then also Wednesday, Atletico Madrid versus Borussia Dortmund. Oh, um, I think Atletico doing... Uh, uh, yeah, I think Atletico ultimately... Uh, no, I want. Uh, yeah, I'm going to stay with Atletico uh, uh, over, the, over the two games. I don't know how it finishes up, you know, the first and second, but I think ultimately Atletico go through. I think Atletico go through as well. Keep in mind this week we also have the quarterfinals of the Europa League and Conference League getting in the way. In the Europa League, AC Milan will host Roma on Thursday in an all Italian showdown. Oh, and that's in Milan, right? Correct. Oh, my goodness. All right. Wow. Christian Polisic. So there, yeah, there's still plenty to play for and plenty of. Uh, Trophies on the line there. Okay, I'm still looking back at that Atletico Dortmund. And and Roma reborn under Daniele De Rossi. He's been a clear improvement over Jose Mourinho. How is that possible? <laughs> well, Jose Mourinho. I mean, he was everything, and he cried, and he was there, and he was the this. And how could they possibly give it to De Rossi? And what's going to happen? And I mean, hey, but it goes back to what we talked about earlier. We'll, so we'll finish the segment here. Is does that preclude uh, Jose Mourinho from going someplace and be successful? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Maybe he just needs a change of scenery. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we got some MLS action we need to talk about. Okay, welcome back. Let's take a look at uh, what happened when it comes to MLS, because there was all sorts of action that was going on. Where should we start, Mossy? We begin with El Trafico. LAFC claimed a 2-1 home win over the Galaxy. All the goals in the first half. Tillman made it 1-0. Aude equalized. And then Buanga from the penalty spot, a highly disputed penalty. We alluded to this earlier when we were talking about Manchester United-Liverpool. Uh, interesting penalty decision here. Again, not a lot of contact. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I did not think... Well, so first off, these are... And correct me if I'm wrong, Mossy. We're now not using replacement referees here in MLS, right? Correct. All right. So these are the, for lack of a better word, these are real referees. 
in that they are sanctioned. And let's be honest, they are paid. My point is that yelling and screaming about referees has nothing to do with how good or bad they are or what their education is when it comes to being a referee. It is just baked in to all of us, whether it's media, whether it's fans, or it's anybody else, everybody screams and yells about this. This is yet another subjective decision. This is yet another situation, as we've talked about, where you don't necessarily have to be touched. This is also a situation where if a player throws their body down in front of you, you are not obligated to attempt to avoid that body. You are not obligated to jump. You are not obligated to step over somebody. and. Did he see and feel what was about to happen and use it to his advantage? Bawanga I'm talking about here? Absolutely. And you know why? Because he's a good player, because he's a smart player, because he understands how humans think, because he understands how the body works, and because he's been there time and time again. And he lured the defender in like a little fish, and then he ate him whole. And I have nothing but respect for players that do it. It used to drive me crazy as a defender, but I could respect the fact that they were doing what they needed to do. So what's the answer? Well, get the ball, all right, in that situation. What's the answer? Hey, don't leave your feet. And if you do, buyer beware as a defender, because this is the stuff that can happen, especially if you're playing against good smart attacking players like Bawanga is. Uh, Yamane whistled for that foul. It's worth noting, Matt Doyle, who according to anonymous MLS execs is the only good analyst on Apple, <laughs> he said it was an awful call. He said it was an awful call. So he thinks that it was a dive. Correct. That it was a embellishment or a dive? Uh, he did not elaborate. He just okay. said awful call. Sean Sullivan thought the same as well. So it was, well, okay. I mean, this is again, the subjective nature of, uh, of our game. And again, the referee has all the technology at his or her disposal nowadays in the games and still came to that conclusion and went over and looked at it and did everything that they needed to do. And that, and this ultimately was the call. I will say when you watch the replay, there is a point where it's not all about the foot, right? It's all obviously about the body. There's a point where that knee gets into Bawanga's, uh, it gets into Bawanga's way. And again, you, you as a defender, you have to be smart and you have to be sure. And there's times where, you know what, unless, you, you, unless this is just last ditch defending, you got to recognize, and I know it happens in a split second, that you got to live to fight another day, or you better be damn sure that you get that ball. So, um, but ultimately I was talking to my son before the game, because we had been talking about how this renaissance of the Los Angeles Galaxy. And let's be honest, at the beginning of this season and up till now, an average type of LAFC team. We know it's going to change this summer and there will be there will be moves. However, I told them this is El Trafico. And like any rivalry, anything can happen. It would not surprise me in the least if LAFC came out, especially at home, and found a way to put a stop to Greg Vanny and company, which is exactly what happened. But it was still a fun El Trafico game. It was back and forth. Um, you know, ultimately, did the better team win? You know, maybe on the day and in the moment. But the Galaxy is still, I think, to be considered one of the good, possibly elite teams. We still are early days in terms of what, uh, what's going on. But in the battle for LA and the LA soccer wars, well, the first one, it goes to LAFC. And it was, it was well-earned. Uh, Vancouver now atop the West. They hammered Toronto 4 0 in an all Canadian affair. Ryan White, Pico, Gold, and Veselinovic with the goals. Yeah, they didn't mess around. And these were, but this was, and I, I, not to defend John Herdman because this was a bad result, but there, this was back and forth if you watch the, uh, the, this game and you watch um, what, or the opportunity. That Toronto, or the opportunities that Toronto actually actually had, but ultimately in this Canadian battle up there, this on paper looks like a ass whooping, um, and it and it, it eventually it it was, and but that's not going to be any solace to uh, Toronto FC. 
Uh, Columbus and D.C. United finished 1-1, both goals in the second half. Benteke scored for D.C. and then Aiden Morris with a late equalizer for Columbus. Also in the second half, Kucha Hernandez, who was making his return after being held out the last two games for disciplinary reasons, got himself sent off for lashing out at McVeigh. And we still don't know what's going on with Kucha, right? I do. I can't say it on the air, but we found out. Wait, you know? Yes. Oh. Well, don't do that. What do you mean? You, you, you're going to keep our listeners and our viewers in the dark because you have knowledge about what was going on off the field? How? Wait, hold on. How the hell do you know? Uh, Marie Seydoux has sources. Ah, okay. Well, I don't. Nobody has told me. Although, I uh, will be talking to Wilfred Nancy this, uh, this afternoon. I guarantee you he's not going to say anything <laughs> about it. <laughs> Team policy. Team policy. Got it. Well, but here's what you do. If you've obviously screwed up so much so that your coach has said, uh, I know you're the potential MVP. I know you score a lot of goals for us. I know you actually are important in terms of me keeping my job, but I'm not going to have you play for a number of games because of something that you did off field that we are going to keep private. Fine. But don't come back when you are finally uh, allowed back onto the field and the first thing you do is get a red card. And it was completely deserved. And he's probably looking around going, what's, uh, what's going on? But um, now they are not going to have him, not because of anything he did off the field, but for what he did on the field. Uh, the Red Bulls with a 2-1 away win over Cincinnati. Kubo scored first. Amaya equalized. And then Van Zier with the winner. The Red Bulls all alone atop the East. Yeah, somebody asked me on the uh, X machine over there if they are legit, talking about the Red Bulls. I, I think that they certainly are legit, and the record speaks for themselves. I'm not ready to anoint them elite yet, but this type of result, and you know, Amaya coming back to Cincinnati and scoring that goal, which was which was fun, and I think he, you know, sometimes. Players will come back and they'll do the whole thing. I don't want to celebrate and all that kind of stuff. I think he really <laughs> enjoyed the goal and really enjoyed the celebration. And this is a huge, this is a huge result. And so now I am, they are well on their way to being from 20, from a 2024 perspective, the Red Bulls, one of the elite teams. Lionel Messi made his return this past weekend. Who's that really? My for goodness. Inter Miami against Colorado. He came on at the start of the second half and promptly scored a goal and helped set up another but it finished 2-2, a heavily rotated Inter-Miami lineup, you must say. Uh, they are winless in their last four in all competitions. But I do think that it shows how fundamentally different this Miami team plays with Messi. And look, you don't need to be a genius to, to figure out that when arguably the greatest player ever to play the game, who is still playing at a high level, albeit experiencing some injuries right now, or at least resting right now, whether he's injured or not, when he steps on the field, they are a very different team. And it's not just in, in the results that they're getting. It's to a man out there, everybody steps up their game. And nobody kind of wants to be embarrassed on their watch when Messi is on the field. And it's infectious around that team. And you see how the awe that follows him everywhere he goes, whether it's with his teammates or whether it's from the opposition, he's found a way to harness that. And while at times it can be a motivational force for the opposition, in this case, he completely deadens it and yet heightens it when it comes to the, his own players around him, and which is great. It's great in that they have that. It's a problem now when they don't have this. And he came on. The goal he scored, even though it got a little bit of deflection, is just passing it into the goal. You don't have to hit it hard. You just have to hit it with direction. And he hit it nice and clean. And it took a little nice deflection, but ultimately went off. And so the dude is just money. I hope that this is the start of now multiple games where he's playing because he's had a nice little rest here. And obviously Miami, in order to be the best Miami and the most entertaining Miami, let's be honest, they need him on the field. And that gets us to the CONCACAF Champions Cup. The quarterfinals conclude this week. You were away last week. I covered all four first legs. It was another disappointing week for MLS teams against Liga MX opposition. Let's get this one out of the way first. Club America with a 4-0 win over New England at Gillette Stadium. Alex Zendejas among the scorers. Afterwards, Caleb Porter said it was like facing a team with 11 DPs. Some people were put off by those remarks. They felt like the days of MLS ung and ang at Me Mexican side should be over. What did you make of it? I mean... Caleb Porter's been around the block, okay? Caleb Porter's been around. And so 
this this comes on the heels also of him over the weekend against Charlotte saying some stuff about guaranteeing a victory. And so Caleb Porter is not a dumb guy. He understands that what he says has meaning and can be interpreted in multiple ways. And yet, you know, his team's not good enough. Or he's not made his team good enough. And not just to compete in CCC, to compete in MLS. They got their first win uh, over the weekend, by the way, in, a, in front of a very sparse crowd over there at, uh, at Gillette. And should be no surprise given how bad they have been so far. But I don't think this is necessarily a surprise. And, you know, it was nice having you, New England Revolution, but you're done. In the second leg, Tuesday at Aztec, I'm not sure New England will even bother with this. They might play the kids. Um, and that side of the bracket is over because Pachuca hammered Herediano 5 mil in Costa Rica. Yeah. Solomon Rondon with his second straight hat trick in this competition. Remember, he got one against Philadelphia in the previous round. They will finish that off Wednesday at home. So we know one semifinal is going to be an all-Mexican affair, uh, Pachuca against Club America. Right. Okay. And then the, the real drama is on the other side of the bracket. Columbus Tigres finished 1-1. Cucho, as we mentioned, held out for disciplinary reasons. Gignac and Diego Rossi scored in the first half. Columbus, the better team for most of the game, but they had Aiden Morris sent off mid-second half. So Tigres ended on the front foot. The scene now shifts to the Stadio Universitario on Tuesday. Aiden Morris suspended, but Cucho back. Yeah. I think when we talked about this last week and we gave some predictions here, I had Columbus going through and I had Inter Miami going through. I, I'm still, I mean, obviously these aren't great results for either of these teams, but they're not insurmountable in that I'm not completely thrown off and I'm not so much, go, I'm not going to change my predictions when it comes to what's going on here. Now, Columbus, it's obviously going to be a very different situation uh, playing away right now, but they will have recognized that that first game I don't think is necessarily representative of how good they can be. And now all that resting that Messi has had comes to bear in terms of the second leg and plenty of drama uh, when it comes to stuff that happened. <laughs> uh, so to set that one up, uh, Inter Miami suffered a 2-1 home defeat uh, last week. Messi did not play due to injury. Inter Miami did take the lead through Aviles. But then David Ruiz got himself sent off in the second half, and that proved costly. Maxi Meza won one. And Jorge Corcho Rodriguez with a sensational strike. 2-1 the final. So now Inter Miami have to turn that around in Mexico, but they do have Messi back in the mix. He came off the bench this week, and I would presume he will start on Wednesday. I, I would. If he doesn't start, I mean, the whole point was kind of resting him for this international competition. I would, I would, I mean, I would think he would be there, and I think what he would start. Did he, did he get into it with the coach? Yeah, so that, that's becoming a huge story. And listen, uh, I listened to the Football Picante podcast. Okay. For weeks, they've been carrying on about how this competition is going to be rigged for Messi to win to get him to the Club World Cup next year. And in the lead-up to the first leg, the Monterey coach, Fernando Ortiz, who is an Argentine, insinuated that as well. I included those quotes in my research notes that I sent to John Strong and Maurice Adu. Those comments got back to Messi. He was there. He watched his team lose. And then afterwards went after the Monterey coach outside their locker room. They almost came to blows, had to be separated. Um, the Monterey assistant coach, in recounting the incident, referred to Messi as a possessed dwarf. <laughs> so uh, it's added uh, some spice to this matchup. I'm looking forward to Wednesday. You know, I, I, I love it, okay? Not just because it creates content here, but when we think of Messi, we think of this you know, quiet, almost... <laughs> Buddhist type of Zen being uh, who doesn't show a lot of emotion. And that's why, remember in, what was it, uh, against uh, Holland after the game? I was and, texting with John Strong about this this morning. After that World Cup quarterfinal, he got into it with Louis van Hall and Edgar Davids and then called Voot Veghurst an idiot and he was really fired up that day I, as well. At that moment, if I had been betting, I would have said, I would have put it all on Messi and Argentina after that because it's one thing to have a Zen Messi that's, that's one thing to deal with. It's another thing to have an angry Messi. And, and there, are, there are players that when they get angry, they actually become easier to fight or to go against. I think it only lights, uh, if you, it's even possible for Messi to have another fire. I only think it lights a, <laughs> another fire in Messi. So a, a pissed off Messi going down to Mexico after what's happened, you know, be careful because you might have created a monster. I agree. 
Uh, Wednesday's match will be his first ever competitive game in Mexico. The last time he played there was a charity match that was dubbed Messi and Friends against uh, some sort of world all-star team. Uh, John Strong had an all-timer. When I told him about that, he said, Messi and Friends, isn't that what Inter Miami is now? <laughs> oh, whoa, look at John Strong with the jokes. Oh my goodness. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you. Um, if I was a betting man, I think Inter Miami go through. I think Messi masterclass, I could see him getting a hat trick and then winning 3-2 and going on away goals. Um, but depending on how this all goes this week, we might be having a very depressing yeah. conversation on our next pod about MLS's futility this season against League MX opposition because the numbers so far are ugly. We'll see if, uh, uh, I don't think New England are going to do anything, but perhaps Columbus or Inter Miami could step up this week and maybe change that narrative a bit. Yeah, but I think it's a good conversation to have in, in you know, the constant back and forth and debate about the pendulum and where it's swinging and, and, and also the separation between El Tri and the U.S. men's national team in that discussion and that debate relative to MLS and Liga MX and that debate and where it is. Because those are two different pendulums and they, are, they find themselves at two very, very different places. Can I, can I just circle back and uh, give a shout out here? Um, you know, we've talked over the last two years about uh, MLS and the move to Apple and everything that has gone on with uh, with them over there. And, you know, I get, I get questions every single day about people that love it and people that hate it. And is it out of sight, out of mind and all that? And I don't, I don't want to get into all that. I actually want to uh, send out some, uh, some kudos and some praise for what I think is one of the great signings of MLS in 2024. And that would be Kevin Egan over there. When I watch MLS and we know that there is this window now on Saturdays where all of these games are happening. As a matter of fact, if, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, this weekend, they had the most games ever when it came to uh, MLS 360, which is the show that he hosts. And it just bops around like a red zone type of thing. That's how I ingest my MLS now. I don't watch the individual games because they're all on, there are so many, and they're all on at the same time. So now I'll go back. But in that live setting, I want to know what the goals are happening. I want to know and give me a snippet of what's happening in all of these different games that are going on. And Kevin Egan, as that host, is just absolutely wonderful in terms of the energy that he brings, in terms of the emotion that he brings, in the way that he you know, referees and moves everybody around. He makes me want to care about what he is watching and what he knows when they go to uh, different games. So shout out to Kevin Egan, um, who is just, I think, really, really good at his job in general, but in particular when it comes to MLS 360. Fun fact, Kevin Egan was a frequent guest on that radio show I did with Eric Winalda. He has overcome that blemish and still got on to have a good career. It's good to move on from things like that into yes. bigger and better things, if you, uh, if you will. All right, should we take another break? Let's do it. All right, let's take that break. And when we come back, it's time for Ask Alexi. Okay, welcome back. It's time for Ask Alexi, that part of the show where you send in your comments, questions, and concerns. You can do that in a bunch of different ways if you want on the uh, social media platforms out there. Keep in mind that our handle is SOTU with Alexi. You can use the hashtag Ask Alexi on all the different platforms, or you can call into our State of the Union podcast hotline, which is 657-549-2297. That's 657-549-2297. Mossy, what do we have today? We have one question on X, Gabe. Henderson asks, is there a formation where we could see Swanson, Rodman, Smith, and Macario all in the field at the same time? No team should be able to hang with something like that. What is interesting about this question, I've been talking about how the U.S. women are loaded with attacking talent. And when that's the case, people like to get creative and figure out a way to get as many of those players on the field as possible. We did see some of that on Saturday in the She Believes Cup semifinals. The U.S. beat Japan 2-1 in Atlanta. And... The U.S. started with what on paper looked to be four out-and-out attacking players, but what made it all work is that Jaden Shaw is so versatile, and she can also function as a third midfielder, so that could easily turn into a 4-3-3. And she ended up scoring one of the goals. She's found the back of the net in all five of her first starts for the U.S., and it's becoming harder and harder to justify a U.S. lineup without her in it. So uh, I'm not uh, above including four out-and-out attacking players in the lineup, but I think she has to be one of them. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. I would only caution that um, this is let's just say these riches are wonderful, and as we always say, or as Tato Martino always says, these are champagne problems to have. However, I I think that what we have learned, or I guess been taught over certainly since the World Cup debacle, and over the last couple of years, is that there needs to be a little humility in the way that we approach things, and I'm not going to tell. Emma Hayes, how to do her job, which by the way, 
the next time you see the national team, will, she will be in charge. Uh, but I think balance, like any coach, is an important type of thing. And so while you have all of these, if you throw them all out in one game, and it obviously depends on the opponent, there is a risk involved. I, I like it because it is kind of big and bold and arrogant, but I think it just has to be done at the right time and in the right opponent, which is actually why I'm so excited to see this final now against Canada because the, the game in the waterlogged <laughs> craziness, I just throw that out because it didn't allow us to see what I think this Canada is, which is a much more possession-oriented type of team and I think much better than what it showed in, uh, in that game last month uh, in, uh, where was it? San Diego and, uh, in, in all that, in, in all that water. When it comes to this new generation of players, there has been a lot of changeover and this is a good thing. All of this competition is good. Uh, you know, we saw, and we've talked about her, Jenna Nyswanger again, start on that left back position. Naomi, Naomi Gurma, who for me was the best player in the world cup. She continues on, although she did go off uh, hurt. So we hope that she's okay. Uh, and to your point, the game did not start off well for the U.S. That's the, it, was, it was bad defending. Um, it was bad goalkeeping from Melissa Nair. And it was the first minute where you have to be turned on and ultimately is a bad start. But they worked themselves back into the game. And so when you look at all of this talent and all of this very young talent that now wants their time, and that's good. And whether it's you know, a Jaden Shaw who, we, who we've mentioned, um, you know, whether it's even the return of Mal Swanson and what that is, it's almost like having a, a, a new player. And then you go down the line and, you know, all of the different players that, uh, you know, that have, that have come in and Albert and all, all these young players. I, I think this is, I think this is fun. And again, I will say this, I know this is leading up to the Olympics. I don't care ultimately what happened. Well, I care what happens, but I don't care about winning a gold medal in the Olympics. I care about everything that happens in that time at the Olympics being used to give us the best chance of winning the World Cup. Because for me, that is the most important thing, the World Cup. What's interesting is Gabe didn't mention Alex Morgan. She is still starting matches for the U.S., so you have to include in the mix as well, even while this youth movement is going on. Yeah, but with Macario coming back too, and you know she's still getting back into the situation, I do not think that Alex Morgan, and, and I, you know, Alex Morgan, if you asked her, yeah, of course, of course she's going to want to be a part of it. And yes, she can do a job. But I don't think that the future of the national team up top is with Alex Morgan. I just think that this was what they had to do and what, and, and what they have done. I just, I, I don't see it. So now you've got, of the old guard, you have Alex Morgan. Crystal Dunn came in as a sub, but I don't see that happening going, uh, going forward. And again, that new sheriff's coming into town with Emma, and she's going to have to make some good, hard decisions. If everybody up front is healthy and in form, my quartet would be Jaden Shaw, Macario, Swanson, and Sophia Smith. And, and Sophia Smith. And Trinity Rodman can be a super sub. Trinity Rodman off the bench, super sub. I like that. I like, I, yeah, I like that. So, uh, you know, they came back, like I said, scored their two goals. Jaden uh, Shaw got yet another goal. And then Lindsey Rand puts in the, uh, the penalty kick. And so I think despite the poor goalkeeping on that first goal, I think Alyssa Nair is going to continue on. Um, and obviously... Lindsay Horan is going to continue on. You know, the Rose situation, she's just constantly not physically able to do stuff, but she's still a player. I, th I think she'll still be in the mix, but I think it's going to, and thankfully so, be a huge changing of the guard. It's exactly what this team needed. Hey, we don't have to get into this too much, but you do also have this Corbin Albert situation yep. as she continues to get better, how the U.S. manages that. Uh, I thought it was very cheeky when they brought her on in this game right after Lindsey Horan scored the winner to try to blunt what they knew was going to be booing. But uh, nevertheless, it's going to be a hot potato for Emma Hayes to deal with. Look, you know, you she's a she's first off, she's 20 years old. OK, and if you were if you were I don't know, I, I don't know who was there, but if you're booing her, it's right, fine, you know. Get your pound of flesh in there. I hope it, I hope it felt good to do, uh, to do that. She apologized uh, for what she did. They're obviously dealing with it in, uh, internally. Uh, it remains to be seen whether she is going to continue on to be the player that people think uh, she is. And obviously she has talent, having been brought in and now started a bunch of uh, games and certainly playing and being a part of this group. What also remains to be seen is how you know, this off-field situation is going to affect her with, uh, with this team. I hope 
that they, the, that they have dealt with it internally and they can go on and they can be soccer players and they can win soccer games and do great things for the, uh, for the country going forward. So, cause she is, uh, she is a talent and I would hate that this is the reason why she isn't, she doesn't get, you know, the opportunity to play for the national team going forward. And I don't think necessarily that, uh, that, that is the case right now, but you got to deal with it. All right, that's Ask Alexi for today. And that leads us right into uh, One for the Road, the end of our show. And at the end of each and every show, I do give you my One for the Road. Mossy, um, never has so much been done with a modicum of talent and a lot of hair. The uh, good folks over at uh, 442 out there on the uh, interwebs, they came up with a list of, I, I think it's the top 50 maybe uh, uh, in the world, in history, when it comes to the game, in terms of facial hair. We've got the top five up here. And my wife informed me of this. She, she came in and congratulated me on finishing atop the list. Not necessarily, no, definitely not when it comes to skill or ability or trophies or anything like that. But when it comes to hair and when it comes to facial hair in particular, I am at the top of this mountain. Um, I get asked about the hair a lot and you know, how it all, how it all came to be. So back in 1993, when we were training for the 1994 world cup for basically two years, we were in residency. And I know some of you that have listened over the years have, have heard this story, but we like to, as we get more and more people into the state of the union tent, remind people of what's, uh, what's going on. Um, so this look came about from training day in and day out down in Mission Viejo at this residency camp that we had getting ready for the World Cup. When I first arrived in January of 1993, Bora Militinovich uh, sent his lackey, his uh, person, if you will, to inform me in no uncertain terms that Bora wanted me to cut my hair. At that point, I just had long hair, didn't have a goatee, just had long hair. And I screamed and yelled and about it, but I would do anything to stick around with the national team with the ultimate prize of possibly playing in a World Cup and being part of that World Cup team in 1994. And so I walked down, we were in Arizona, never forget, walked down the road, got my hair cut, put all the hair into a bag and brought it back with me. Bora saw me in the team meeting that night, looked at me, nodded, and never for the next two years did he say a single word about my hair or the way that I looked. It was a test and he was testing me, and that's what Bora did. And for different people, it was different types of tests. He was testing me as to how I looked. And I vowed from that moment that I got out of that barber's chair that I was going to grow my hair back even longer, and I was going to uh, grow a goatee. This is, you know, obviously the early 90s, and that whole grunge thing was happening. Uh, this is also a time where, even though we didn't call it branding, that's really what it was. And personal branding, you know, there's kids think about it and talk about it right now. But I recognized that my aesthetic and the way that I presented myself could have an impact in terms of the performance. I always considered myself an entertainer and my costume, whether it was the uniform or the clothes that I was wearing, or whether it was the way I presented myself in terms of my hair. And I wanted to stand out. I wanted to uh, have a look and a distinctive look. And I certainly, uh, I certainly did. And I used it to, uh, to my advantage. I grew up, you know, thinking about things in terms of entertainment, in terms of performance. Obviously I equated a lot of things with, with music and the way that bands or individual artists branded themselves and the way that brand, uh, individual artists and bands used their aesthetics and the way that they costumed themselves and all that, all that kind of stuff. And so that's how this ultimately came about. It went away and it has been away for a long time and it will not make a return. I, uh, I, I, clean, I like to say I cleaned up on the outside, Mossy, but I'm still a mess on the inside. But it's nice to know that it's still being recognized uh, when it comes to lists out there of facial hair. Yeah, you could not have played for George Steinbrenner's Yankees no. or Daniel Passarella's Argentina. They were both staunchly against facial hair. Incidentally, Rivalino... Brazilian legend is my dad's favorite all-time player. So the idea that you're ahead of him in any context this, this must nauseate so my father. This makes me so, <laughs> so happy uh, that, that, that I am. By the way, uh, Abel Xavier, uh, Xavier, whatever you want to call him, uh, I brought him to the galaxy at one point. That did not work out the way that I thought it was going to go. But incredible hair. And just the nicest man that you've ever seen. Um, but he was, you know, kind of past his prime when ultimately he showed up uh, with the galaxy. But I... 
I always, like I said, I, I always considered myself a performer. You go on stage, which is the same thing as a field. Uh, you wear the costume, which is the same thing as a uniform. You rehearse, which is the same thing as practicing uh, or training, whatever you want to call it. And you go in front of a crowd, which is the same thing as an audience or anything like that. And I wanted to have a reaction in terms of the things that I did and in the terms of uh, the way that I, uh, that I presented myself. And it's one of the things that I love about soccer because there's no helmets, because there's, you're not all covered up you really get to express yourself. But the long hair uh, aesthetic, it hasn't really continued. You know, a lot of things are cyclical, right? They'll, they'll come back and maybe it will eventually here, but the long hair thing in soccer really hasn't found its way back. So who knows, maybe in the, uh, in the future, it will be right back to this and we'll have a nice goateed long haired Crazy guy running around there. Anything before we go, Mossy? Last, last thing. We're taping this on Monday morning. Tonight is the men's national championship basketball game, UConn-Purdue. Both Sean Sullivan and Kat will be rooting hard for UConn. They're still bitter over Tennessee's Elite Eight loss to Purdue. They hate Zach Eady. Um, this past weekend, we also had the women's final. South Carolina beat Iowa. I know you got caught up in this. You, you were posting about it on X. You chimed in on that controversial moving screen that UConn got called for late in the semifinal against Iowa. It's a moving screen, okay? I don't know what everybody's complaining about. I, I don't understand that. Look, I know nothing about basketball. I do not watch basketball, all right? College, uh, pros, I, I don't understand it. I don't enjoy it. I can respect the athleticism and I can respect the fact that it is a popular sport. But for me, it does nothing. I tuned in to watch not just basketball, but college basketball, not just college basketball, but women's college basketball for one reason and one reason alone. And that's Caitlin Clark. That's how much she is permeated. That's how important she is, not just to college basketball, but to the sport. That's how much of an iconic figure and how much power she has amassed. All right. I knew about it, and I voluntarily tuned in to watch, to see her play, not to see anybody else play, not to ultimately see who wins, but to see her play. And anybody out there that is screaming and yelling about Caitlin Clark, you are a moron. Attach yourself to this, all right? This is a rocket ship. This is a messy type of situation that you, whether you're an individual or you, whether you are a league or you, whether you are a sport, can benefit from. Well, what's interesting is a lot of the everybody out there you're alluding to are other women's players, current and past, who do not like this whole Caitlin Clark story and are crapping on it, which has been an interesting aspect of the whole discourse. Well, uh, then Christian Pulisic, uh, you know, Forget it. I don't think that he's the best player ever, uh, American player ever to play in Italy because he's got uh, incredible players to play around, okay? He's got American players that are there, all right? He probably, if he doesn't want to, doesn't even have to speak Italian, all right? So, <laughs> so yeah, I, I, saw, I saw that. I just think it's, it's bad form. It's sour, sour grapes. Sports progress. Sports evolve. Even the, rule, the rules and the laws change and the sit situation changes. If you want to get all caught up in the apples and or oranges comparison, fine. But in this case, again, I, the, the, the woman that, uh, that had a go at Caitlin Clark, I never even heard of you. I have no idea who you are, but I know who Caitlin Clark is. So that's, again, the power right now of what's going on. And, and times have changed. And I, I congratulate her on not just a successful career as a basketball player, but transcending the sport and bringing people into the tent. We talk in soccer all the time about how important it is to introduce people to the sport, to bring people into the, into the tent. And she did that on a consistent basis, so much so that someone here who doesn't even like the sport, doesn't even watch the sport, made a point of tuning in. That's, that's what you need. For any sport. Women can be catty. You should hear what Aaron, Kyla, and Kat say about each other back there. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> All right, my friend. Anything before we go? That's it. All right, listen. Thank you for, uh, for tuning in. Thank you for uh, downloading and rating and subscribing and doing all the different things that you do. It's great to be back here. We will be back later on in the week. As we mentioned, uh, there's all sorts of stuff going on when it comes to uh, Champions League and 
CONCACAF Champions Cup, which continues on. And myself and Moss will be working that uh, this week. So enjoy your soccer on the field and everything else off the field. We'll talk to you again later on this week. And until then, and as always, my friends, size the day.